Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. So we've been talking about anger, one letter away from? Danger. One letter away from danger. And uh, we talked about, you know, the meaning of anger. Anger is simply an emotion of fear and pain. That's what anger is. And then if you were to define anger just a little bit more, I shared this last week. Anger is an emotional response in the face of wrongdoing. That's the reality. And um, I want us to, to learn about this, this, this real thing that we deal with called anger because we all have to process anger, every single one of us, because anger is always lurking at the door of our heart and, uh, and it's just waiting to get a foothold. And then Satan gets a stronghold in our life. And so we have to, we have to learn how to process. We have to learn how to uh, manage and control our anger. And uh, that way we never get ourselves into a place of danger. And you have to remember this. Anger is a learned response, guys. For example, you know what? Have you ever gone to an argument with maybe your spouse, uh, a, a child, your friend, whatever? And you're just like, ah, da, da, da. And you're just like letting it loose, man. You're just like, you, ah. And you and and you're gonna and then the phone rings and you're just like, hello. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's right here. Hold on. <laughs> and so it's a learned response. It really is. It's a. Le- Let me tell you something. Christianity is a learned thing. If you're not careful. I was watching this video. A friend of mine sent it to me, and it was a video of a of a of a prophet, uh, evangelist, and. Uh, and he's in the middle of the church service, and, and he went, it was in Africa. And, uh, and, and this one, so he calls up like a calling for prayer and to cast out demons and stuff like that. And so this guy comes up, and the pastor starts going like, ah, and he's like casting the devil out of this guy. And the guy's like, ah, and he's all over the floor, everything, right? Then his cell phone rings. He stops. He's like, hello? Why are you calling me right now? I'm in the middle of my deliverance. Okay, pastor, keep going. <laughs> it was hilarious. It's a learned response, guys. Sometimes our cray-cray is really cray-cray. You know what I'm saying? That's what anger is. Now, don't get me wrong. There is such thing as genuine, authentic moves of God. But I think what happens in our life is that we learn things. And sometimes instead of it being constructive, it's destructive to our lives. Does that make sense? And so... um, so it's, a, it's, it's something that's real. So don't be the person that says, oh, well, no, I'm angry because my grandpa was angry, my dad was angry, therefore I'm angry, and my mama was angry, and I'm angry, and my kids are angry, and Uncle Chewy's angry, now I'm... So, so it's, it's get out of that mindset that, you know, this is who I am because it's in my family line. No, this is who you are because you learned to be that way. But just like you learned... To respond that way, how many know that you can unlearn to respond in a destructive way? And you can relearn to respond in a healthy way. Because anger is a beautiful gift that God gave us. But what happens is sometimes it becomes a brutal thing. And then we come up with that whole word, brutal. Right? It's a brutal thing. Anger can be beautiful or brutal. But the question is, how am I going to begin to process this anger that I constantly deal with. Look at this, Romans 12, verse 2. Check this out. God wants us to change how we view things. Look at this. He says, don't live any longer the way this world is. So I'm telling you, God is being very straight up. Stop living the way this world lives. You got to stop. You got to stop. That's a personal decision. You have to stop living. In other words, it's very clear that the world has a way of responding to anger, and God has his way of responding to anger. The world has a way how it lives their life, and God has a way on how he expects us to live our life. He says, don't live any longer the way you were B.C. before Christ. No more, no mas. He says, let your way of Thinking. Let your way of what? Thinking. So check this out. Events, you remember the cycle of anger? Events create what? Thoughts. And thoughts create what? Emotions or behavior. 
So God is saying we need to change the way you think because your thoughts, as you renew your thinking, we can renew the way you view the event that you experience. Maybe you, there's people here that have been molested, you know, abused. People here that have experienced a very painful event. You know, someone passed away and you, you still have the sting of, of that. Um, there's, there's, you know what, people sometimes have trauma from an accident that they have not been able to get past. And so what happens? Fear grips them. And so these are all, uh, uh, it's, it's the primary emotion. Remember, anger is the secondary, not the primary. So you have to trace what, what emotions that you're dealing with have brought you to the place of anger. And if not care careful, one letter away from danger. And so here he says, so let your way of thinking be completely what? Changed. In other words, God doesn't want you to just, okay, I got saved and I'm just going to, you know what, well, I'm going to keep this part because this is good about me. No, God says, no, I, I, want, I want to redecorate you. Yeah, it's like, you know, we're in the holidays, right? Thanksgiving this week, awesome, right? What's the first thing we do after Thanksgiving? Go buy our Christmas tree. Well, guess what? Last year's decoration probably weren't the greatest, right? This year you can do it all over again and have an awesome decoration. God says, I gave my son Jesus, and my son gave you his spirit, Holy Spirit, who comes in your life to redecorate the way you live. He redecorates everything about us. Come on. When the Holy Spirit moves in, he changes the look. Come on. He, he moves things around, right? When we had no God, we did things the way we wanted, and then we messed it up. Then God comes in, and he starts rearranging your life. That's where restoration comes. That word restoration is what? Renovation. God wants to renew you. God wants a renovation in how we think. Why? Because as a man, what? Thinks, so, so is he. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Why does God want us to change our thoughts? Well, let me put a point up real quick. If the thought is what leaves us stuck, isn't that the truth, right? So we know the thought is what leaves us stuck. It's not the event. Many times we stay stuck with the event. It's the event. The event hurt. No, no. How many thoughts do we think every single day? Come on, church. 60,000 thoughts per day. That's how many thoughts we have. 60,000 thoughts per day. So if we have 60,000 thoughts per day, I wonder how many of those thoughts are angry thoughts. I wonder how many of those thoughts are painful thoughts, fearful thoughts. How many of those thoughts are bitterness thoughts? And so here God's saying, I want you to get unstuck of your thought life. He noticed he didn't say, and, and, and renew your event. No, he says, renew your mind. So the reason most people never move from the event, whatever painful event you had, Come on, whatever hurtful event you had, the reason we don't move from it, it's not the event. It's the thought that you had regarding the event, which has now given birth to the emotions that you feel about the whole event, which brings you to a place called anger. We have to understand this, church. If not, we're not going to be uh, intelligent people of God. God wants us healed, but we got to go a little bit deeper. Amen. It's not just a wave of the hand. No, we actually, actually have to process. What is it that I went through? I have to begin to address those issues. Why? Because God wants me to completely change, completely change my thought about the situation. God wants you to have a different angle about the event. You know what? So many times we, we, we come to a place where it literally, that event just tears us up, tears us down, where God's saying, no, listen, Mauricio, every single event that was painful. I want to turn the tables on the devil, and I want to use it for something awesome in your life. I want to take that place of hurt and pain, and I want, I want that to be your greatest teacher, right? You're in school, and now I'm going to teach you how you can have a better, a better life. Look, being a thought makes it absolutely true or defining, okay? So being a thought However, number two, having a thought helps you what? Recognize that it's just a thought. In other words, have you ever heard that thought or that idea, 
Be the ball. In baseball, be the ball. Be, I am the ball. I am the ball. I'm the ball. I am the ball. Ball, you are coming to me, right? Same thing with golf. Be the ball. Be the ball. Be the, I'm the ball. And, and, and so you get, that's what happens with us. Think about it. You stay stuck with your thought, and now you be your thought. Think about it. I'm stupid. I'm so stupid. I never do nothing right. I, so guess what happens? Anything you put your hands to is never right. Right? Because you messed it up before you even got started. Why? You be that. As a man be? I, I'm always lonely. I have, nobody loves me. You know what? Then you have to qualify your thought, right? Because here's the truth. Well, let's just, let's just really ask that question. Nobody loves you. Yeah, nobody loves me. Okay. Do you have a mom? Yeah. <laughs> does your mom love you? Well, yeah. Well, does your love, dog love you? Yeah. Okay, well, then that is a lie that no one loves you. See, but we don't, want to, we don't, we don't even want to talk like that. We don't, want, we don't want to even think like that. Why? Because we're too consumed with being the lie. So what does God want us to be? He wants us to be the kind of people that just take a, a thought and say, you know what? I'm just having a thought. For example, let's say right now, you know, you're going through something that's challenging physically, right? So God's saying, okay, the thoughts are going to come, right? Boom, thoughts are going to come. Fear, you know, uh, uh, intimidation, all these thoughts are going to come. But that's okay because we're all going to have thoughts. So just say, I'm having a thought. Okay, I'm having a thought. Everybody hold on. It's, I'm having a, and why, why? Because if I'm just having a thought, what I'm saying is I'm recognizing that it's just a thought. In other words, this is temporary. It's not forever, right? Maybe right now you're financially just broke. You know what? You're not going to say, man, I'm always broke. I'm broke. I'm broke. Well, guess what? Stop being broke because then you'll stay broke. And just say, you know what? My thought is right now, I am lacking finances, but praise God. It's just a thought. I'm giving it permission to come in, and I'm giving it permission to drift out. <laughs> See, you, you change the angle of how you think. You have to do this. Why? Because it's real. It's real. This stuff that we deal with is real. And so God's saying, I need you to stop being a thought because when you're being the thought, here's what happens. It also tells you that it's your truth and your reality. Where having a thought says, listen, it's not necessarily the truth and it's not necessarily your reality. Because I'm just, I'm just having a thought. And we all have thoughts, 60,000 of them, <laughs> right? So when that negative moment comes, I say, having a thought. Praise God. Having a, let's all do that. Ready? Just having a thought. Having a thought. That's it. Just having a thought. Yeah. Why are you being negative? No, it's just, just having a thought. <laughs> Don't trip. Just having a thought. Huh? No, for that one, just like having a thought. It's just more like that. Just having a thought. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Okay, so, so it's okay to have a thought, but the problem with us is when we have our thought, we think pain and not gain. You know what I'm saying? Where, where, see, where you're stuck on pain, <laughs> oh my God. and I'm not here to deny your pain, but I'm here to tell you, stop being stuck with your pain. Stop it. But you don't know. Stop it. Be completely changed. If you're going to roll with God, you will be completely changed. But you don't know what they, you're going to be completely changed. Or you're going to be completely stuck. That's up to you now. But you don't know. If you were there, you're going to be completely changed. You're going to stop living the way this world is. You're going to stop thinking the way this world thinks. You're going to stop thinking revenge. We need to stop that noise. We need to stop. We need to process the pain and realize that this pain is going to be for my gain. It's gonna, for example, when I was a young kid, I grew up in gangs, man. And, and when I came to Christ at 21 years old, I thought to myself, wait a minute. So I started processing without even knowing that I was processing. I'm like, okay, I came to Christ. I was an atheist. Now I'm receiving this Jesus who died for my sins. And, 
And I'm like, okay. And my nickname was Temper. And I'm just like, okay, that's all I know is to hurt people. And, and uh, that wasn't a thought. See, my, it started with an event. And it started, and then it's, it went to the, the thoughts. And then my thoughts is what I became. I became Temper. I became angry. I became hateful. Uh, all these things. And then, and then I was willing to, I told my, the Holy Spirit, you were willing to die for a stupid street name. That's not even yours. It's the city's. Like, how stupid is that? Like, where are you from? Well, uh, what? It's, you don't even own it, dude. It's, and then I thought to myself, you know what I thought? I said, okay, well, if I was bold enough to die for a stupid street name, then I'm going to be bold enough to share my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm going to be I'm going to be outrageously bold. I'm going to tell the whole, I'm going to go and claim the big old J, Jesus, right? And be like, Jesus, right? Just gangster. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so what happened? Instead of, instead of being stuck with the pain of seeing so many of my friends be murdered and so many of my friends uh, uh, end up in prison, I started taking that pain, and I said, I'm going to make this a gain, and I'm going to learn from this, and I'm going to be the most radical disciple of Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. You see why? Because the devil already took my childhood, and he took my teenage years. But he didn't get my 20s, he didn't get my 30s, and he didn't get my 40s. Praise God, right? So you have to take your pain, and you have to go ahead and start having some gain. Right? But there's some people here. Let me talk to you, the young people. Millennials. How many millennials do I have in this room today? Lift your hand if you're a millennial. Okay. Okay. Some of you are afraid to even lift your hand. That's all, that's all right. That's all right. You think you're old and all that. But, but let, let me tell you, millennials. Here's the problem with young people. Young people have wasted a lot of their time. Now, don't get mad at me. Don't get angry. Listen. So many young people have wasted and are wasting life. Why? You're wasting it with, with you know, still clubbing, uh, still hanging with the wrong crowd, uh, wasting it with, with uh, you know, dating all these different people. I've dated this, that, and all that, and, uh, and, and been there, done that. And I've had probably in just my millennial years, I probably already had like five plus jobs actually going on ten. And, uh, and you know what, and then you got all these young guys, you know, God bless them, you know, they're, they're, they're masters of video games like Call of Duty. They're laying aside their call and their duty instead of mastering the call of God because it's the duty to serve our God. And so, so we have young people that are wasting their 20s and even entering into their 30s. And then one day they wake up because now they're in their 40s and they're angry. Or you wake up in your 30s and you're angry because you don't have what you wanted. Why? Because the enemy wants to keep us in the old life to keep us from ever coming into the new life. Because God forbid you ever come into the new life with Christ because God has something so amazing for you. And if you were ever to step into that life, that call of duty, oh, my God, you would change this world. You would. And so the enemy keeps us in our pain so that you don't gain. Oh, I know it is good. Oh, I know. It's real good. And then you, have, let me, then you have the 40s and 50s who have been saved for a while. I mean, they've given a whole new definition of saved, praise God. I've already done my time with God, praise God. Let the young people now serve. No, what is wrong with you? You know, it, it's like you turn 40 and you think you're already retired, God. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've done my time. You know it. And it wasn't even a crime and so forth. And so you have these 40, 50-year-olds that all of a sudden they get to this place of being stuck. And they just kind of feel like, man, you know what? Withdrawing is the best thing for me to do. You know what? This is a time for me to give my family my time. Not realizing that that's twisted thinking. It's twisted. Where did you get that thought from? Show me in the Bible. Let me tell you something. In the Bible, shows 8-year-old kings. 
and it shows 120 and even beyond that 700-year-old men and women serving God until their last breath. Where do we get the idea of 40, 50s, and 60s that it's time for me to sit back and relax and just go on cruise control? Then we wonder, what is going on? Why am I like this? Because when you don't serve him, you swerve from him. It's the truth. So you waste your 20. I've already wasted enough childhood and and teenage years, why am I going to let him who stole, why would I let him continue to steal longer? You have to come to the place like, okay, Satan had my 20s, but he ain't getting my 30s, praise Jesus. You know what? As a matter of fact, my 50s will be better 50s, right? It'll be the best 50s of my life. It'll be the best 60s of my life. It'll be the best 70s of my life. It'll be the best 80s of my life with God. That's what God wants. He wants us to go ahead and, and take the, the pain of whatever experience you've had, and he wants you to make it your gain so that you can accomplish and step into everything. God wants you to master. If he wants you to master anything, it's your call and your duty. You have to serve God. When people start thinking, why? My job is to, is to serve my family. Duh. No duh. That's the given, bro. That's the given, sister. Obviously, you better love your kids. Obviously, you better raise your children. That's your job. <laughs> However, God says, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your what? Soul. soul. What's your soul? Mind, will, emotions. With all your heart, with all your soul, you love God with everything. It didn't say love your family with all your heart. With all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength. No, it says first love your God, then love your family. No, I'll even say, it says then love your neighbor. You see why? Because when you as a believer, when you learn to serve God with all your heart, you will learn how to serve your family with all your heart. But when you twist it, man, you don't serve anyone but you. You serve your agenda you serve your vision, you serve your dream, and here's what happens. God wants his dream to become a reality in your life. And so that's where a lot of our anger comes from because we have a lot of disappointment in the church, so much disappointment. I thought I would be further by now. I thought I would be better by now. Man, I thought things would get better in this family life by now. I, and we get this all, and we're stuck, we're stuck, we're stuck. Negative, negative, negative. Ne and then you wonder, why haven't things changed? Because you've prophesied into your future. Quiet up in this Catholic church today, huh? <laughs> yeah. I want us to get this, guys. <laughs> Come on, we should learn how to leverage our anger. Learn to leverage that baby. Come on, let your anger motivate you to do good. I want to learn what, what makes, you know what you should do? You should learn what makes God angry. Think about it. God was angry at this world. And you know what? He was so angry that he displayed his anger on the cross. Oh, yeah. For, for God so loved the world that he was angry about the world being separated from God because of sin. And so God, it says, the Bible says that he poured out his wrath on who? His son. Can you imagine that? Talk about wrath. He, he says he poured out all his wrath on his son. Let me tell you something. God does not hate people. God hates sin, not people. So he unleashed his wrath on the cross, and Jesus took the sin of every single human being on planet Earth. All sin, past, present, future, took it all upon himself. I mean, it was, he was the perfect sacrifice, and God is just pouring out the wrath. Ah, I hate, he was destroying sin, not destroying you. He wants you. So God, God took his anger at sin and was motivated by it to do something to get you back. Talk about, ah, what gets God angry? Let me give you a perfect example. Go real quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 17, quick. 
for Samuel chapter 17. Because here is a perfect example of a person by the name of David who literally took his anger and allowed it to be his, um, his motivation to do something amazing. And we know the story, right? He shows up. He's, well, first he's, at the, he's in the desert taking care of his father's sheep, right? He's tending the sheep, doing what he's supposed to be doing, being a good kid. And his dad calls him over and says, hey, go take some, uh, some, some you know, uh, grilled cheese sandwiches to your brother, cheese and bread. And so now David is all excited because his brothers are on the battlefield. And, you know, David, man, he was being prepped by God. And, uh, and so he shows up to the field, and he sees this Goliath, and he's kind of tripping now, like, why aren't we fighting, you know? Here's little David, right? I mean, David is just a kid who's tending sheep, and when Saul should have been fighting Goliath, he was all sitting back, relaxed, just taking a chill pill, not doing what he was supposed to be doing. And let's take it up on 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to read through different verses, so stay with me. 17 verses 20 through 37, 42 through 47, and then we'll... We'll end with 49. However, if you're a note taker, open up our, our Elevate Church app. We have our notes there. You can fill in the blanks. Look at this. This is David. David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard him speaking with the men. What was David talking about? Well, David shows up. He forgets the sandwiches. And he starts talking to guys because he heard a rumor that Saul, the king Saul, said, if anyone defeats this Goliath, you get my daughter. And you'll never pay taxes again, and you'll be filthy rich for the rest of your life. So David was like, what? And so he starts going, and he's getting the 411 from all these different soldiers. Like, hey, man, I heard. T tell me what. I okay, explain this to me. Yeah, you get the daughter. You get, is she fine? Oh, she's fine. Oh, okay. So, and then, and then wait a minute. You don't pay what? You don't, you'll never pay taxes. Never pay taxes. And you'll be, you'll be, what? And so check this out. So he's out, he's right there inquiring, right? So, so look at this. So Eliab heard, who's Eliab? Eliab is his brother. And he's hearing him talk to the men. And look at this. Check this out. Here's anger again. And Eliab heard him speaking with the men. So he what? Burned with anger at him. Have you ever said that to yourself? Like, oh, right now I'm just burning right now. Huh? Like you can, you can feel the fire. Right, it's like, ah, I'm just like burning, right? And so, so he burned with anger at him, and he asked him, why have you come down here? And look, look, look what jealousy does. Look, anger leads you to jealousy, and jealousy leads you to a lot of stupid talk. Look what he says to him. He asked him, why have you come down here? Who did you leave those what? Few sheep. So in other words, he was telling him, you know what, David? You're just a small thing. I'm a big thing. You do little things, I do big things, bro. What are you doing? Little you, what are you doing here? And look at this. I love this. And, uh, and why have you come down? Who would you leave those few sheep with? I know how proud you are. Look, at, look what jealousy. Jealousy will literally twist the way you think. He, he's the prideful one, and yet his angle of, of, of how he sees David is like, why are you so prideful? Pride people don't know they're prideful. Look, he says, why are you so proud? And look at this. And I know how evil your heart is, David. Talk about, talk about deceit. But let me tell you something. Angry people, they have a distorted point of view. They always do. They do. They see. Why? Because they have their own truth and their own realities. Why? Because they be the thought. They're not just having a thought. Is that, is that connecting now? And so he says, and the only reason you came down was to watch the battle. What have I done now is what David said. Man, what have I done? You know, David was just a, a teenager here. Said, David, can I even speak? Then he turned away to speak to some more other men. So he's going back and he's confirming it. Hey, guys, so, so tell me about this chick. You know, like, are we the same height? And, you know, I mean, so he's just a kid. Just think, he's just a kid. So he's done. He's talking. His brother's talking smack. And he's, like, going back, and he's getting more confirmation. He wants to get validation of the story if it's true. And so he turns, and he speaks and to other men. And he asked him the same question that he had asked before. Look at that. I wonder how many times he kept asking the same question. And they gave him the same answer. And someone heard what David said and reported to Saul. Look at this. So Saul sent for him. David said, Saul, don't let anyone lose hope because of this Philistine. Listen, David shows up and he has a motivated anger. And he looks at the king. He says, King, bro, let me tell you, you better stop losing hope. You see, a healthy anger 
restores hope in a very bad, angry situation. A soft answer turns away wrath. And so he says, yo, don't lose hope. It's all good. We got this. And then he starts cussing this uncircumcised Philistine. He's going to go down today. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was his cuss word back in the day. So don't let anyone lose hope because of this Philistine. I'll go out and I'll fight him. Saul replied, you aren't able to go out there and fight the Philistine. You are too young. He's been a fighting man ever since he was a boy. But David said, listen, Saul, let me tell you my experience. See, because my experience have created these thoughts that you're hearing today. And my thoughts have created this behavior that you're seeing now. Are you with me? So check this out. He says, so let me tell you something. He says, I've been taking care of my father's sheep. Sometimes a lion or a bear would come and carry off a sheep from the flock. Then I would go after it and hit it. I would save the sheep it was carrying in its mouth. If it turned around to attack me, oh, man, I would grab hold of its hair and I would strike it down and kill it. In fact, I killed both the lion and the bear. Oh, my. I'll do the same thing to this uncircumcised, stinky Philistine. He isn't even circumcised. <laughs> <laughs> not even so he's laughing with the king, right? He isn't even circumcised. He has dared. How dare he? Look at this. He has dared the armies of the living God to fight? Are you kidding me? The Lord saved me from the paw of the lion. He saved me from the paw of the bear. See, think about it. He, wasn't, he experienced an event that was very brutal. Can you imagine fighting a bear? Come on. Some of you read this and you hear me, it's like a fairy tale. No, this is reality. This is the Bible. God left us the word of God to show us an example of what men and women should look like. God's saying, hey, listen, what does a bear do? Man, it bites. What does a bear do? It bites. What do people do? They bite. <sighs> they slap. He says, man, I've had an experience of pain with the lion and the bear. And he saved me from both. Keep going, please. And he'll save me from the powerful hand of this Philistine too. And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Keep going. And Goliath looked David over and he saw how young he was. And he also saw how tanned and handsome he was. Come on. He showed up with a tan. And he hated him. And he, look, and he what? And he hated him. Look at, see, listen. Eliab had daddy issues, but so did Goliath. You see, anger always stems from something. Most men have daddy issues. That's why they never step into their manhood as men. That's why there are more spiritual women leaders than there are spiritual men leaders. Why? Because there's an anger inside a man. He's angry about how his upbringing was. Why do our sons become dysfunctional? Because they're a product of you. We have to change this, church. Men, we got to change it, man. How dare the enemy try to come and attack God's family? And he said to David, why are you coming at me with sticks <laughs> do you think I'm only a dog? The Philistine called down curses on David in the name of his God. Come over here, he said. I'll feed your body to the birds of the air. I'll feed you uh, to the wild animals. And David said to Goliath, man, you are coming to a fight against me, bro, with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I'm coming to you against you in the name of the Lord who rules over all. He is the God of the armies of Israel. He is the one you have dared to fight against. This very day the Lord will hand you over to me. I'll strike you down. I'll cut you. <laughs> this very day I'll feed the bodies of the Philistine army to the birds of the air. I'll feed them to the wild animals. Then the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. The Lord doesn't save by using a sword or a spear. And everyone who is here will know it. The battle belongs to the Lord, and he will hand all of you over to us. What if we started looking at our events that way? 
Realizing that the event is trying to choke you up. The event is trying to keep you there. The event wants to have a funeral service in your life every single day. And you got to be like David and have a, 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 a motivated anger that looks at that ugly Goliath and say, Goliath, you're coming down. You uncircumcised Philistine. How dare you think that you can come up against the family of Ruiz? How dare you think that you can come up against the family of Samora? How dare you think that you could come up the family of Guerrero? How dare you think? What if we started having that kind of attitude of anger? Huh? Something that motivates you. See, you got to find out what does God hate? What makes God angry? Because that's the kind of anger I want to have. Thank you. Can I tell you what makes me angry? Don't get angry when I say this. What gets me angry is when people show up to church late. It really makes me angry. But it's a righteous anger. You know why it makes me angry? It makes me angry because how, how is it that we dare to not be the perfect sacrifice for God? during a time of worship. I mean, that's the only time in the service where you actually get to express how thankful and how grateful you are to your God. Oh, no, pastor, that, man, that's wrong. What do you mean? What's, see, you're still thinking like the world thinks. The world says, you don't tell me what to do. God says, you submit yourself in order to resist the devil, in order for him to flee from you. And so why do we get angry about that? Because listen, man, especially you dads and moms, ah, you're strolling with your kids late to church. You know what you're teaching your kids? Be like me. Don't care about being on time to your work, to church, to whatever. You're, you're not training them to be excellent. You're training them to be late. How can you do that? Unacceptable. So it makes me angry because why? Because guess, guess what, guys? We are not a babysitting center at this church. Your children also have worship. Your children also get a message. Your children also tithe. Your children are also experiencing the presence, the person, and the power of God. And how dare we rob them from that experience? How dare you rob you from that experience? You need to bring that Goliath down. You know what else makes me angry? It makes me angry when people don't tithe. Don't get angry. I have been tithing since the age of 21 years old. The moment I give my life to Christ, I didn't question tithe. I just did it. Why? Because if I was radical to serve Satan with my money, I'm going to be radical to serve God with my money. And I get angry. Why? Because you know what? There's this stigma in church that when I give my tithe, I give it to the pastor. You know what? That is a foul and ugly mindset. Number one, God doesn't need your money. Let me just tell you that right now. He don't need your money. You know what he needs? He needs your heart. That's why you tithe. You tithe because he wants to know that your heart trusts him in everything. That includes my finances. In the entire body of Christ, it's been like this for 21 years. Only 3% of the body of Christ actually tithe to their home church. You are not tithing to me. Your tithe, the Bible calls holy. So when you bring your tithe, you have to get out of the mindset, oh, I'm giving my money to the church. No, you're not giving your money to the church. You're giving your money to God. See how distorted we can be? No. So when I bring, I've been tithing for now 21 years, and I've given many offerings to many different ministries, and here's what I do. I always bring my offering. I say, Lord, I am sowing this seed into the work that is happening here, Father. I'm sowing this seed into this message, which I do that when I hear a message that just hits me between the eyes, I always sow, I plant a seed in that. Why? Because I'm saying, Lord, that was for me, and thank you for that. And I sow the seed into that ministry. You know what? I don't care what that ministry does with that money because I didn't give it to the ministry. I gave it to my God. At that point, it's that church's responsibility what they do with that money. My sole responsibility is I honor God with my money. That's it. 
We need to change the way we think, church. So it makes me angry because most Christians are broke. And the world is very wealthy. You know why? Because they apply godly principles and don't even know it. Most wealthy, listen, most wealthy, and I've studied this very much, most wealthy people, I have many wealthy friends, most wealthy people give 10% of their income to something they believe in, a cause. It may not be the church, but they'll give towards like, like you know, Children's Hunger Fund or they'll give it towards, you know, a City of Hope with kids with cancer, but they give 10% of their income. If you read any multimillionaire, billionaire, they say that one of the greatest and most important things that you should do is always give 10% of your income. And then you wonder, why are they blessed? And I'm broke. Because you rob yourself and you're robbing God. The tithe belongs to the Lord, not you. It's like a pie. You have a piece of pie. I love pumpkin pie. You tear up that pumpkin pie, and little do you know that, oh, my God, God says, I give you, I give you ten slices. You eat nine, leave me one. And you know what we do? We're just tempted. And then you eat the pie. Number ten. You ever done that at home? Your spouse tells you, save me that piece. And you're just like, the devil made me do it. And then you just, you just, you, 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 you eat it, right? And then what happens? You know what happens? You know what you bring to God? Listen to me. You know what you bring to God? You bring the crumbs. You crumb giver. No, seriously. How, how dare you? And if this bothers you, that's because you have a daddy issue. You don't have a church issue. You have a heavenly father issue. You don't believe him. Or trust him when he says, I'm the Lord of your money. I'm the Lord of your heart. I'm the Lord of your health. I'm the Lord of your life. I am Lord over everything. Last thing gets me angry. It gets me angry when people don't serve. How do you not serve? Like, I don't get it. How can, how can one just come to church and keep going to church? I get it. There's seasons where people come, they're getting healed. You know, they're getting restored. I get that. There's a lot of people that come here like that. They come from ministries and they're burnt out. And I always tell people like that, hey, just sit, receive, and enjoy. But at what point do you just keep sitting and sitting and sitting and you never give anything back to God? You're a great receiver, but you're not an awesome giver. Serve. When you don't serve, you swerve. You swerve in life. You constantly jump from church to church, church to church. To, why? There's no root. There's no root. Nothing is taking root. So there's no flourishing. There's no growing. You're wondering, why is all this a mess? Let me tell you why. Because God wants us to take the anger and let it motivate us to serve. We serve we serve God. We serve God. We serve God. We teach our children to serve God. We teach our children's children to serve God. We teach them to worship God, serve God. Come on, live for God. Why? Because when you serve God, you discover your call and duty on this earth. When you don't serve God, guess what? You go years and years and years like, God's never told me what to do. Well, you've never done nothing for God, so how can he tell you anything? You just waltz in, waltz out. So it gets me angry. Why? Because many of you should be so much further. I see the potential in your heart. I see the potential in your life. And it's like, oh, my God, if they only knew how amazing they can be in the, in the kingdom. We got too many people serving the kingdom, not the kingdom. I love, get it, I get it. Achieve your goals, achieve your dreams, but not at the expense of not living for Jesus. Not serving Jesus. What gets you angry? What gets you righteously angry? Find out what gets, what gets God angry. You know, that makes God angry. How many think that it makes God angry when his, he's been so graceful, so merciful, so loving? He saved you. He rescued you. He healed you. He took you your feet out of the mud and he says, I put you back on a rock. How many think that God probably gets this righteous anger when his people don't serve. Lift your hands right here if you believe that. I think so. I think so. Yeah. 
What does Paul tell us? I'm going to leave you this final scripture. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. Everybody say, leverage my anger. Second Corinthians 13, 5, quickly. Look at this. Last one. We're out of here. Let's go home. He says, examine yourselves as to whether or not you're in the faith. Examine yourself and check yourself right now. Say, man, God, have I been robbing you from my time, my talent, and my treasure? Have I been, have I just, have I been this, this person with my own agenda? Lord, forgive me. Have I been this, 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 this free person, just, you know, a butterfly, I go where the wind takes me? And, and you're just like, wait a minute, God's an organized God. God's a God of order, not disorder. And you have to just examine yourselves as to whether or not you're in the faith. He says, test yourselves. Everybody say, test myself. You know what? You know what's a good test right now? If this is upsetting you, what I'm saying, I hit the mother load. I hit it good. And I'm glad I did. And some people may not come back to this church after you heard me say what I say. But that's okay. Because the Bible says that not everyone's going to get it anyways. And it says many will depart from the faith in these last days. Giving heed to doctrines of demons. In other words, you come up with your own doctrine. And that's dangerous. So he says, test yourself. Do you not know yourselves? In other words, what's wrong with you? you got to know yourself. Know what makes you angry. Know what's destructive, but know what's constructive. And know what's a motivator for you to do good and not evil. Amen? He says, unless indeed you are disqualified. Come on, we need to get a, a honest and true angle of whatever it is we're dealing with. We have to get a different angle, a different point of view. I pray that the Spirit of God speaks to you. I pray that the Spirit of God moves you into action. I pray that the Spirit of God just stirs your, your, your heart and the gift that's within you so that we can go ahead and go from anger, come on, from a dangerous anger to a healthy anger that motivates us to be like David. We're talking about the most amazing king on planet earth. David served the Lord. With all his heart. If it was good for Jesus to serve God on this earth, it's good enough for me. How about you? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. Man, I came to serve. Where did we, the church, misinterpret that? Last time I checked, Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples with all crusty cheese and everything, just washing them away. Hey, he was even serving the enemy. Washing the enemy's feet. The one who would betray him served him. Wow. Talk about forgiveness. Talk about grace. Notice he took that anger of motivation said, I'm going to go watch this cheesy feet right now. And let this bring conviction in his life. All right? Bow your head, close your eyes. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.